are, episode number six of Dogs in Our World. To celebrate the halfway point of this 12-part series, I have a phenomenal guest to share with you. Temple Grandin is one of the biggest names in the worlds of animal science and autism awareness. She recently traveled to Vashon, Washington for a weekend of lectures and visits around the island and was kind enough to start her trip with us. If you haven't heard of Dr. Grandin, I recommend the 2010 Emmy Award-winning HBO movie titled Temple Grandin and starring Claire Danes. In this very special episode of Dogs in Our World, Dr. Grandin tells us a bit about herself and offers advice to those of us who have a family member with an autism label. She also helps me better understand the autism spectrum, dogs, and the importance of volunteers in an animal shelter. All that and more in this nearly unedited conversation with Dr. Temple Grandin. You are listening to Dogs in Our World, a show that explores the history, science, and importance of the domestic dog. Here's your host, Adam Winston. And continue to tell me a little bit more about yourself, please. Well, I've been at Colorado State University for 26 years, um, teaching a class in livestock behavior and cattle handling. I've done a lot of work with the meat industry to improve uh, uh, humane treatment of animals. I've got some books on animal behavior and animals in translation, Animals Make Us Human, both available on Amazon. I have a lot of books on livestock. I've got humane livestock handling for large ranches, and I've just come out with a new one that's got beautiful photographs. Be really good for 4-H kids on handling cattle, pigs, sheep, and goats. It's called Temple Grandin's Guide to Working with Farm Animals. That just came out. And then I've got textbooks, Improving Animal Welfare, Practical Approach. And if you're really into the science, I've got Genetics and the Behavior of Domestic Animals, but that's an expensive textbook. Anything else that people might know you for? Uh, I do a lot of talks on autism because when I was a young child, I had all the full-blown symptoms of autism. Uh, No speech, didn't talk until I was age four. Fortunately, I had very good early therapy. I can't emphasize enough. If you have a young kid who's not talking, you've got to start working with them, teaching them how to talk, teaching them uh, turn-taking. These kids have got to learn how to wait and take their turns. Autism goes from somebody who remains uh, nonverbal and maybe has trouble dressing themselves all the way up to Thomas Edison and Einstein. Einstein didn't talk until age three. It's a big, big, big continuum. You see, a little bit of autism, you got a socially awkward person who may be just absolutely brilliant in the tech industry. Too much of that trait, and you've got, um, uh, you know, severe handicap. And there's a parallel with animals, I read a fascinating study that was done over in Europe looking at differences between wolves and dogs. And a brain can either be more social-emotional or it can be more cognitive and thinking. And we've bred the dog to be super social-emotional towards us. And in a test that was done in Europe, they had a wolf watch another wolf open up a puzzle box to get some food. And the wolf does it easily. But the domestic dog is so busy asking us for help and looking for us for help, doesn't pay enough attention to open the box. I also found another fascinating journal article on more social animals versus more solitary animals. Like, for example, lions are more social than panthers. And again, there are parallels here with autism. Now, are panthers defective? Absolutely not. You see, in the mild forms, it's just normal variation. A brain can be more thinking, or a brain can be more social-emotional. Is it possible that animals could experience autism? Well, if you put an animal in a very deprived environment, you can start getting repetitive behavior that resembles some of the repetitive behavior that many autistic kids do. And one of the reasons why sometimes autistic kids do repetitive behavior is they do it to shut out an onslaught of sensory overstimulation. When I was a little kid... We used to go on a ferry, just like the ferry you got here. And when the horn went off, I'd fling myself on the deck and start screaming because it hurt my ears. Today, I'm happy to say, I was right there in front of the horn, and all I did was flinch a little bit. But when I was a little kid, it was like a dentist drill going into a nerve. And so they'll do the repetitive behavior to block out some of these things. A dog that you keep locked up in a kennel all the time gets kind of stir-crazy. You have a lion that will pace. I'm not going to say that's autism, but it's one of... uh, 
symptoms that you see in, in both uh, situations. So I, I work in an animal shelter, and, and what's, the, uh, what's the real word for it? Stereo-optic behavior? That's called stereotypy. You know what dogs in an animal shelter need? And I have a student, former student, Krista Coppola, uh, her uh, PhD thesis work, and we've got it published in the Physiology and Behavior Journal. And Krista found that um, dogs that had, you know, she played with you know, for 45 minutes, had lower salivary cortisol compared to the dog just chucked into the kennel. So what the animals in an animal shelter need? Each dog needs a volunteer to come in for 30, 45 minutes a day, quality play and fun time with a person. Dogs need people. And I've gone into kind of junky animal shelters. They're all chain link fence that had a really good volunteer program and you didn't have all the barking. But dogs in kennels that don't get enough contact with people go crazy. And are you saying that you see a parallel between some of these repetitive behaviors with, with animals that have spent too much time in their enclosure? And there's a parallel to uh, the repetitive behaviors that we see in people with autism sometimes? Well, people with autism do it because the sensory environment is overstimulating. So they do it to block out and overstimulate. Uh, the, the dog does it due to the lack of stimulation. I see. Mm-hmm. You see, it's like a different cause. I see. But the behaviors have similarities. Now, when I was a little kid, my parents would let me do half an hour, an hour a day of some repetitive behavior. And that would help calm me down. But the problem is, if you let the kid do it all the time, he's not going to develop. And one of the big problems I'm seeing today with kids labeled autistic, maybe ADHD, there's a lot of crossover with ADHD, getting addicted to video games. Hmm. I'm not suggesting banning video games, but they need to be severely limited to about an hour a day. And we've got to get these kids out doing other things. I was never allowed to become a recluse in my room. I was out doing things. Before we started recording uh, today... You, oh, you I were... thought we were recording already. <laughs> well, we are recording. Okay. But before we started recording, you were asking me kind of some discovery questions. You were, how, how do I know when I'm talking or working with someone who, who experiences autism? Well, there's a point you might have very mild autism as just a socially awkward person. And there's a point where that's just normal variation. When I was out all the time working on the big construction projects with the meat industry, I worked with a lot of skilled millwrights and skilled tradespeople that I know are mildly on the autism spectrum. In its milder forms, it's called geeks and nerds. It's called Silicon Valley. Then you get into the more severe forms. You can end up with somebody who, no matter how much therapy they get, cannot dress themselves. You see, it's a continuum of traits. Mild forms, just part of normal variation. Now, the thing the person needs is kind of socially awkward, is they have to be taught social skills, like training somebody in a foreign country. You can't take anything for granted. You have to explain to them uh, that they should be saying please and thank you. You have to show them how to shake hands, demonstrate the... um, distance that people stand away from each other. If they call a colleague stupid, you need to pull them aside and explain that that's simply not okay. Fortunately, there were some people that did that with me. Now, a lot of the people in my generation, the geeks and nerds, ended up going into good careers. And one of the reasons for that is social rules were taught in a much more rigid way in the 50s and 60s than they are now. And uh, the autistic kids are having a lot more problems with that than the so-called normal kids. I want to, I want you to teach me and advise me and tell me information that I can share with some of my dog training students and people that I care about who have a family member with autism. And I want to, I want you to teach me about if, if having a pet dog can help someone. For some kids, dogs are the best things. I have observed there's three different ways that kids with an autism label react to dogs. Best buds love them, absolutely love them. They just understand each other. Then the second type, kind of afraid of the dog at first, but then they warm up. And then there's a third type where I don't think the dog's appropriate. And it's usually sensory. They don't like the dog because you never know when it's going to bark. You don't like the dog because maybe his smell. smell. You see, that's a sensory thing, and then the dog's not appropriate. Now, other things we need to be teaching kids with autism, and a lot of kids, is just responsibility. Feeding the dog, taking care of the dog. Um... The life skills that the come life with it. skills are associated with it, and the biggest problem I'm seeing with kids with an autism label or some other label, um, when they get to be you know, you know sixth grade or so in high school, is they're not learning how to work. 
Our generation, we had paper routes. We need to find substitutes for paper routes. Start teaching kids in middle school how to work. When I was 13, mother set up a sewing job just in the neighborhood, and I took apart dresses and hemmed them. I saw a farmer's market just down the road here. Perfect thing for an 11-year-old, a 12-year-old to go out there and help with those uh, farmer market booths. They need to learn how to do tasks on a schedule outside the home. Then the instant they're legal, get into the real economy. Uh, when I was 15, I was cleaning nine horse stalls every day and basically running a horse barn. That teaches the discipline and uh, responsibility of having a job. What other advice could you give to a parent who's thinking about getting their child a dog? Well, does a kid like dogs? So you might want to try out the next-door neighbor's Labrador Retriever. The other thing I've found with many things, whether it's kids liking dogs or, or something you go into for, to a career, you got to expose the kid or the person to things. You don't know what you like or not don't like until you get exposed to it. I'd like to see a lot more young people getting into dog training, but somebody's got to expose them to it. I get asked all the time how I ended up in the beef cattle industry. When my mother got remarried when I was 14, that brought a ranch into the family. And then I went out on my aunt's ranch, and I took guests on trail rides, and I waited on some tables and did a whole bunch of other things out there. I got exposed to the cattle industry. That's why I got interested. So let's say someone's uh, child who experiences autism does like dogs and says, I want one. Then well, what, if what he's advice a kid, can you give If he's a kid that is verbal enough to say he wants one, you've got to remember autism has all these different levels. Okay, you can have a little kid like me that at age four looked absolutely horrible. And he worked really hard on the little kids. Some of them get fully verbal, others do not. So autism sort of goes into three levels. The kids get older. Fully verbal, learns to read and write at a normal level. Maybe genius, maybe he needs to go to Silicon Valley. Certainly capable of holding a job. Then you have a moderate level, maybe only partially verbal, but there's a lot of jobs they can do. And then you have a very severe level where maybe dressing themselves is difficult because you may have epilepsy on top of the autism. Mm. How could a dog help someone at that level? Well, in those situations, the dog, sometimes they tether the kid to the dog so the, dog doesn't, the kid doesn't run off. But let's say you have a fully verbal kid wants to have a dog. Yeah, I'd get him a dog. But I'm also going to teach him the responsibility of taking care of it and feeding it and walking it and playing with it. A dog is a responsibility. And that would be a perfect um, uh, time to teach them that. Maybe they need to go on a dog training class. They c we need to get kids interested in, in doing something other than sitting in a room playing video games. Because what I'm seeing on fully verbal kids, there's two paths I'm seeing. I'm going to a lot of meetings. I'm talking to a lot of parents. One kid learns how to work before he graduates from high school, goes on to college, gets jobs, does really well. Another kid holes up in his room and recluse playing video games. We've got to work on preventing that from happening. And if you've got a kid that is holed up in his room playing video games, we need to work on weaning him off slowly. Maybe doing something with dogs. Uh, maybe doing auto mechanics. I've been pushing a lot of skilled trades because there's a huge amount of jobs available in the skilled trades that are not going to get replaced in the future by computers. Have you ever had a dog? And if so, did, it have, did having a dog help you? Well, we had dogs when I was a kid, but the animal that helped me the most was horses. How? Well, rode horses. I got them ready for show. My whole life have revolved around horses. Another reason why horses helped me is I had friends with a shared interest of horses. I was bullied and teased in high school. And it's really important to get into activities where there is a shared interest. And my friends all liked horses. And we liked the real horses and we liked the plastic model horses and we decorate those. Could you recommend any other books or sources for parents who are thinking about getting their uh, children with autism a dog? Can you point them towards anything they should well, check out? Well, I have a book called The Way I See It, which is a lot of little short chapters, and there's a chapter in there about service dogs, and I talk about the three ways the kids respond to dogs. I've got my animal books, um, Animals in Translation, and in Animals in Translation, I explain how being a visual thinker helped me understand animals. What do you mean by that? What do you mean by you're a visual thinker? Everything I think about is a picture. Okay, like right now, I just mentioned a book. I saw the cover of it. I'm, I'm, I'm seeing pictures of dogs coming up in my head. I don't think in words. It's all pictures. I store like snapshots.
My conversation with Dr. Grandin continues in about 45 seconds. Uh, check out pictures of our visit and leave us a comment at dogsinourworld.com. You can also let us know what you think of this show by leaving a rating and review on iTunes. Uh, doing so helps more people find the show. Coming up in the second half, Temple Grandin will continue to talk about how we can help young people and also give us further insight into how some animals and humans think. We'll be right back with more Dogs in Our World. Be sure to connect with us on Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, and Pinterest. You can also message us directly via the contact page at dogsinourworld.com. Don't forget to subscribe to the podcast on iTunes, Google Play, Stitcher, or SoundCloud. Support Dogs in Our World by making a donation. This fun and informative show is free to the public, but it's not free to produce. Every dollar donated goes directly towards production expenses. Help Adam improve the lives of dogs and people through more episodes just like this one. Donate today at dogsinourworld.com. There's a lot of students that are hungry for doing hands-on activities. And they find that they really like doing them. But they've got to get exposed to it. I just read an article in Time Magazine just a couple of days ago on community colleges. And there was some a person from the Urban Institute, and he basically said, young people today don't know what they want to do. And I think, the, now he didn't give a reason for it, but my reason for it is I don't think they're getting exposed to enough different things to figure out what they want to do. And then he talked all about this wonderful community college that they had out in the West um, where you could study wind turbines and solar panels and irrigation systems and all these interesting things to expose the students to that could turn into careers. I love it. Uh, a friend of this project, this podcast and show here, uh, Margaret asks, she read your book, Animals in Translation, and she talked about how you were writing about how both animals and people with autism or people with autism process emotion, similar to how animals process emotion. Do you know what she's... What? I think most of my interviews, I talk about how animals think more than emotions. Now, I do have stuff in my other book, Animals Make Us Human, where Katherine Johnson and I talked about the Jack Panskep uh, seven core emotional systems, uh, like uh, fear, rage, separation, distress, seeking, that's the urge to explore. Then, of course, you've got sex, you've got mother young nurturing, and play. And I think a lot of these emotional traits are like a music mixing board. Recently, I read a book about police dogs. And then I just read a book just the other day, a galley proof. It was called Have Dog Will Travel. It'll be coming out next year. It's about a um, blind person's experience with guide dogs. And I got to thinking about the kind of dogs described in those um, two books. And the police dog would be a high seek, low fear, uh, probably uh, low on the separation distress, low on the... Uh, sort of the affection sort of trait, where the Labrador guide dog's going to be a low seek, I don't want it running after balls, a low fear, don't want it scared of things, but really lovey-dovey and affectionate. You say you'd set the indicators on the music mixing board differently for the guide dog than you would for the police dog. And I think in looking at some of the genomics now, that's kind of how genetics works. And in Animals Make Us Human, we discuss... Um, the Jack Panskep emotional traits, and those are the things that drive behavior. The other thing I discussed in detail in Animals in Translation was that an animal is a sensory-based thinker. What do you mean by that? Well, when I first started my work with cattle, I noticed they'd be balking at a shadow, refuse to walk over a shadow, walk over reflection. A code on a fence would make them stop. And it was obvious to me to be looking at what cattle were seeing. But... It wasn't obvious to other people. But when I first started doing that in the 70s, I thought everybody thought in pictures the way I do. I didn't know my thinking was different. And then when I did my book, Thinking in Pictures, I started asking people about 
other ways that uh, people think. And I found out there's kind of a pattern thinker. There's also a word thinker. Not everybody with autism thinks in pictures. And I further discuss this in another book I have on the autistic brain, where I discuss visual thinking, mathematical thinking, and word thinking. But animals are going to be sensory. In Animals in Translation, I discuss a horse that was terrified of black hats because he was abused by a person wearing a black hat. And another um, person wearing a white hat has no effect on him. You see, it's a visual memory. Or maybe it's a certain sound is associated with something bad. Fascinating. Is there anything else that you can share or any other advice you can give to people as they are thinking about how adding a pet dog to the family could help? Well, a lot of these kids need the re- need responsibility and chores. And you get a pet dog, the, the child needs to learn how to take care of it, you know, brush it, feed it, play with it. Needs to take care of the dog. We need to be teaching these kids responsibility. One of the things I see, especially on the higher end kids where they're fully verbal, I see the mom doing too much for the kid, talking for the kid. Uh, my mother had a very good sense of how to stretch me, always getting me to do new things, but you don't just chuck a kid into the deep end of the pool. You've got to stretch. And, and um, because if you don't stretch, they don't develop. And one of the biggest problems I'm seeing now with the fully verbal kids is not learning how to work. I'm seeing them graduate from college and then just have a horrible time in the workplace because they haven't learned things like get up in the morning and get to work. This is stuff that in the 50s I was taught this when I was, you know, seven years old to, to, to be on time. And, and when I was in high school, one of the things that really helped me is the fact that for about three years I basically ran a horse barn. I mean, I cleaned thousands of horse stalls. And I put the horses in and out and I fed them. And there's a discipline and a responsibility to doing that. And my parents were not that happy at the time that I did very little studying. But when I look back on it, I was learning how to work. And you were out of your comfort zone, right? Yeah. And, and you know, I started working the horse barn. I went out of my comfort zone. But then I got to loving doing it. And I had friends, you know, involved with everything we did with horses. We were really into, I did English equitation. And I was really into getting the horse ready for the show. And, and I, so I got friends through activities with horses. But I also learned how to work, and I didn't realize until just five or six years ago how important all that time I spent cleaning those horse stalls was, because I'm seeing too many kids today, they can't, they're unemployable because they haven't learned work skills. And I want to get the transition from high school to work done before they graduate. Now, if we have a kid where we have not done that, then we got to slowly wean him out of his room. We give him choices. We give them choices of things to do. Say, okay, we'll try a little auto shop, or maybe we'll try some other job, and you gradually wean them off the video games. Is there anything else you'd like to share with the folks that will be listening to this? Is there anything that I missed that you'd like to address? I just want you to think about that an animal is a sensory-based thinker. You want to understand an animal... Get away from verbal language. Another thing about animal mind... What do you mean by that? How can I get away from verbal language? Well, he's going to store pictures in his brain. Specific sounds. um, uh, Smell sensations. I read an article one time by Oliver Sacks about a guy who took some drug and it made him get smell detail. He said, well, I can imagine what it would be like to be a dog. It's a world without words. Uh, Animals are very much into the tone of voice. Uh, One time I was at a really nice dinner party, and uh, they had a beautiful buffet spread out, and their dog jumped up on the buffet table, and I was the only one who saw it, and I just went, ah, ah, and he got right back down and slunk away. And I made that sharp sound just as he was ready to get a piece of meat, right before he got it. Uh, That was urgent. Yeah, he understood exactly what I meant by that. Well, and I'm also kind of seeing a parallel, too, that if you can practice how to communicate being nonverbal, then maybe you can also better communicate with those humans that might be nonverbal around us, too. Well, there's some nonverbal individuals that can actually learn to type. You can have one person who's nonverbal where they've got very severe intellectual challenges, but there's other people that are nonverbal where they can learn how to type, and it's important to use a tablet And the reason for using a tablet is the print appears next to the keyboard. Laptops and desktops often don't work because you got to look up 
to see where the, the print is. And there's a, there's a man named Tito Macapadahe, and he has a book called How Can I Talk If My Lips Don't Move? And uh, he describes a completely sensory jumbled up world, how he couldn't control his movements. Uh, there's another book by, called the Re Why I Jump uh, by an autistic boy, and he's coming out with a new book this summer that's going to be a whole much better, describing the jumbled up um, uh, sensory world. Uh, you all know what it's like when the TV pixelates really badly, and it can pixelate so badly that the sound goes out too. That's the way some people on the severe end of the spectrum experience mm. the sensory world. And when they get tired, it gets worse. This is making me think of a very specific hotel that I went to. And uh, 9 o'clock, I turned on a TV show, and it pixelated a bit, but it was watchable. But then as more guests came in, and they put more and more load on that network, by 10 o'clock, it was absolutely useless. I couldn't hear any audio at all. The picture was completely just all little squares constantly. Uh, and you're it saying went that's from what some people are yes, seeing up here. Some people with very severe problems. That's the kind of problem that they're having. Now, what happened on the TV is the audio went off. What I think happens to a lot of people is the audio would turn into just a horrible jumble, like overwhelming, overwhelming, sound, yeah. banging on things and noises. Dr. Grandin, it has been an honor and a pleasure to be able to talk with you. And I know you've been traveling all day and you've got a big day ahead of you. Anything else you want to add as we wrap no, it up? No, I think we've talked good. about a lot of good stuff. And and um, I've got a lot of books on autism. Uh, you can always search them online just using my name, Temple Grandin. Amazon's got them all. Just make sure you search with my name and spell it correctly. And your website is templegrandin.com? Templegrandin.com or just go on the Amazon website. Just put my name in, Temple Grandin. Um, all the books will be there. It's been a pleasure. Thank you so much. What a gift and privilege it was to talk with the great Temple Grandin. What a powerful and brilliant human, right? I would like all of you to think about what Dr. Grandin said regarding the importance of volunteers in animal shelters. If you're interested in working with animals or maybe you're a student looking for a way to gain some volunteer credit, I recommend researching any local animal shelters in your community and see if they have a volunteer team you can join. Again, I also recommend watching the 2010 HBO biopic of Temple Grandin, starring Claire Danes and Julia Ormond. Emily Gerson Sainz and Mick Jackson, the director, and Christopher Munger, the writer. They did a fantastic job putting that project together. I recently re-watched the film on iTunes, and it's still one of my favorite movies. It should also be available on Amazon Prime and the HBO apps. Don't forget to let us know what you think of today's show at dogsinourworld.com or leave us a rating and comment in iTunes or wherever you listen to podcasts. I will talk to you soon. <laughs>